How are you? Great to see you. Man, you look and sound amazing. Just as Jeff just told you, starting a new series here, going to go four weeks uh, on marriage. And so, it, guys, if you didn't know this was happening, gentlemen, you got roped into coming by the wife. Maybe this is your first time here. Surprise! Uh, you're not going to get picked on, okay? Relax. So before we go into the depths of where we're headed just for today, just going to lay a little bit of foundation, a really important component about marriage. I want to make a couple of pre-statements, and these are important pre-statements to make um, because basically if, if you don't get these, you're going to kind of be a little confused about what's happening. Um, and I want to lay all my cards out on the table with you. First and foremost, doing a marriage series does not mean I'm saying I'm a marriage guru. Okay? I believe marriage gurus are like pink unicorns. You can believe them all you want to. They're just not real. They don't exist. There's not some marriage guru. There's not somebody that goes, I just wake up every morning, me and the wife have sex, eat some chocolates, and then we float through the remainder of our day before we go to bed again. Okay, it's not that deal. That's just, it's not, did I just wreck your life? You're like, oh, great. It's just, it doesn't exist. If you're in a marriage, you're married to a sinner. You are. If that came as a shock to you, welcome to Sherman Bible. Glad you're here. It, it, you're married to another human being who's innately selfish, and the only hope they have in escape of that is the gospel of Jesus Christ as their heart is transformed by his love and through his word. See, so and we're not going to try and come from a place of saying, look, here's a guy who's got it together. I don't know anybody like that. I've known guys that claimed it, but none that actually have that. The second component cards I want to lay on the table is this is not a series that I tend toward wanting to preach. Very, marriage is very controversial. Marriage is very hard to talk about. It's very personal. It pokes on some nerves that are presently in our society really painful. It brings up memories in people that, that cause real visceral reactions, wounds, things that people have gone through. It makes people feel really insecure, really vulnerable. You know, what is he going to say? What's that going to be like? Generally, most marriage uh, messages or series have to do with get the, get the man in the room, beat the hell out of him, literally, and then the woman will have a better life. You know, and maybe there's that's truth. I've just never seen the fruit of that. And so I'm going to say some things that aren't going to be uh, socially popular. They're not culturally popular. Uh, I want to readily, rightly confess, I am an insecure man. I, I am. I want, to, I want to be liked. I've told you this since I got here. I want you to like me. Why? I already love you. I pray for you. I don't know all of you, but what, who I do know, I love. I don't want you to see me in the community and be like, oh, there's that guy. Hate him. I, I, really, I just, oh, that feels terrible. I love people, I love you, I want to be liked, but there are some things I have to lay on the line and not and risk not being liked in order to tell you the truth, okay? Because I really do love Jesus more than I like you or want to be liked by you. And so I want that. And also I have a vicious, in my old man, in my wicked, sinful heart, you know, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Yes, I'm born again, but man, my flesh is still prideful. My narcissistic pride would want to be able to say, look, we're just growing and growing and growing and never say anything that would run you off. <clears throat> never want to do anything that would offend you. So other people can look at us and go, wow, Sherman Bible's growing. They must really have a lot going for them and this, that, and the other. You know, I'm confessing it, that I'm pushing that aside. I'm not going to live according to that. We've covenanted that as elders. It's not going to be our motive. You know, we've talked about going to fourth service on Sunday come this fall. Second service is basically like herding cats. It's so full. It's probably why some of you have spilled over into here. You, those are the people you fought with in the parking lot on your way in. Some of you are convicted. I said to the elders, I said, we probably want to wait on that till after the marriage series. We may only need two ser services, so. <clears throat> well, well, so be it, right? But let's tell the truth. We'll tell the truth. 
We'll leave the results to the Holy Spirit. God knows what he's doing. Let's just take him at his word. If you're new to Sherman Bible, we just teach the scriptures. We go out of that. We know that God has ordained the scriptures to be the spiritual food for the believer and that the Holy Spirit reminds us of those things, stirs those things in us. So we teach the gospel. We worship in the gospel-centeredness. That spills over into community, and we end up on mission and relationship, not just because we made it up. So here's what we're going to do. Series title, all right? Got to have a title because some of you are type A. Marriage is the greatest. Why did I title it that? Because I wanted to say marriage is the greatest. I love being married. I really do. Does that mean it's easy? No, it's not. And we'll cover that in successive weeks. I'm going to pull back the curtain a little bit, talk about what this thing actually is. Then I'll pick on the men a little bit. I'll pick on the women a little bit, and we'll be done. But marriage is the greatest is the series. And this first message is titled... Contract or covenant? Contract or covenant? I have two points that I'm going to get to in a moment, but let's just cover what it is. Is marriage a contract or is it a covenant? Let's just understand this together. A contract is an agreement legally stated for the purpose of protecting you. Okay? You enter into a contract, you do it with a lawyer, and you, you, the lawyer helps you, somebody with legal expertise helps you, and you write out that contract. You contract to sell a house, you contract to buy a car, you contract all kinds of different business angles, and you do it to ensure the performance of the other for the, for the protection of yourself. That's a contract. Okay? Listen to me. Marriage is not a contract. Marriage is a covenant. And a covenant differs from a contract in this way. A covenant is set in motion for the purpose of ensuring the good of another. A covenant is there to provide the provision for someone else, to ensure that someone else is taken care of. And you, in a covenant, are laying down part of yourself for someone else. That's what marriage is. It's a covenant. In fact, that's why we use the word covenant in our membership here at Sherman Bible. It's why we do it. We say covenant membership. We want people to go, what? Wait, what? I thought I could just, why can't I just join the church? Well, you can join the Starbucks reward program. You can join the Moose Lodge. You, you, know, you can join, no, we want you to come in and give who you are as we give who we are. That's why we call it covenant membership. Because it's an agreement we take seriously. It's not, a, it's not an eternal covenant. It's not a covenant till the death. Not all covenants are marriage or covenants uh, through Christ. It's a covenant. It's a, an agreement for the protection and provision of another. That's what local church is about. It's not a shopping mall where we come and go, wow, oh, let's see, monkey boy, come on. Let's bring it. Let's see how well they sing. I'm going to see if I like the seats. You know, if the vibe is right, as long as you guys don't do anything to ruffle my feathers, tell me something I don't like, as long as I don't find something better, you know, I'm going to, okay, I'll hang around. You know, great. I'm glad you're here. I don't want you to go, but I would encourage you in this. Maybe there's a place where you would want to join. We'd rather you do that, see, because the covenant is a place of safety and provision. So covenant, not contract. So here's, I've got two points. going to do two things related to covenant. Here's the first one. We're going to define the covenant. Define the covenant. Number one, define the covenant. Now, all through history, God has been a God of covenant. He made a covenant with Noah. Not going to flood the earth again. Here's a symbol. It's a rainbow. There's always a symbol. Made a covenant with Abraham. Yeah, right? I'm going to give, make a people out of you. Here's the symbol. It's circumcision. I prefer the rainbow. Uh, here's the covenant with Moses. Right? Covenant with my people, I'm going to have a people. Here's the symbol, it's the Torah, it's the law. Covenant with David, you're always going to have a man on the throne. Jesus is the fulfillment of that, right? He's a covenant God. In fact, Jesus instituted the last and what he called the new covenant. This is Luke chapter 22, 19 and 20. Remember, he says, it says, and he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me, and likewise of the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. What is he saying? I started the new one. The others, you had to perform. I'm doing this one all myself. He made covenant with himself. By the way, the word covenant comes from a Hebrew root, which means to cut. 
So what they would do is they would slice up animals, and when they made the covenant, don't worry, it's not part of membership. They, they would walk between the parts of the animals, and they would make the agreement, saying, this is what they were saying with their life was, so be it to me if I break this covenant. You see, what God did when he made covenant for us in Jesus Christ so that we could be reconciled back to God by grace through faith and what he did on the cross, he was cut for us. He was cut for us. He was the lamb slain so that we could enter into that covenant. So the definition of covenant is that done for the purpose and provision of another. The marriage covenant starts here, Genesis chapter 2. And if you want to go in your Bible, again, to go to Hebrews chapter 10. You can hold your place there and come over with me to Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 18. You've probably heard this before, but I want to get us a little bit of a definition so that we're on the same page. And again, much of this is culturally not really popular right now. It still doesn't change the fact it's true. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. That's interesting. He was with God. He wasn't truly alone, was he? Well, he was alone in that he didn't have someone who was his equal, compatible to him. I will make him a helper fit for him. Here's what I want to say off the bat. Look, when God made woman, he didn't make someone lesser than. He made an equal to. He made an equal to Adam. It literally means I'll make someone he fits with. And now you think about that. There is a, I mean, we know what that means, right? The growing ups, amen. That's a good thing. Marriage fits. It's cool. God set that up. He gave us someone to walk with. He gave you women someone to walk with. And under the, under the provision of creation, that's what, that was equal. Those were equals. It means they fit together. It doesn't mean, oh, get him a helper. Like, you know, we'll pay her minimum wage. She'll do the cooking and the cleaning. Adam will be out there atoming. No. Fit together. A companion. And they go through the process. Verse 19 says, Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and brought every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. So here goes Adam. He's going to name them. Naming all the animals. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. I personally feel like Adam got tired, maybe a little lazy near the end. Right? Red bird. Black bird. Bluebird. He's wearing out, man. He started out hippopotamus, right? It's a downward trajectory. That was, that was a joke, if you're new. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up the place in its uh, the, the flesh in its place. Actually, I skipped verse 20. Go back to verse 20. The man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of heaven, and the beasts of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. He just couldn't find one. So God puts him to sleep, takes one of his ribs, takes that out. Verse 22, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones. I've been waiting on that. He was relieved. It's a good thing. And flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. It, it, was, a, it was a union, you see. He'd waited on that. It wasn't a, a man and God. It was togetherness. There was an equality there. There was a, a loving, joyful together. That's how loving God was. I'm going to give you someone fit for you. Verse 24 says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast. This is the initiation of the covenant. Hold fast. Your versions might say cleave or be joined to. The bach is the, is the Hebrew word. It means to be completely locked, completely joined. He'll leave his father and his mother. He's going to be joined together to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. That word one is very important because the word ikad is the word used for one. That's a word normally used to describe God. When the Jews would say, the Lord our God is one, they would use the Lord our God is ikad. Adonai, ikad. The Lord God is one. He is three 
persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, yet he's one. How is that? That's a mystery. I can't wrap my mind around it, but it's true. And in the marriage covenant, God sets it in order and says the two will be one. Okay, so Jesus then takes this and clarifies the definition even further. Let me read you this. Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 3. And the Pharisees came to him and tested him. Oh, wow. Happened all the time. They were dreaming up tests. Hey, let's say this to him. Somehow we'll get him in trouble. And then all the people will hate him and they'll want to put him to death. Okay, so here we go. It's one of the many. They tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Now, time out. Why was this a test? This is an important question. Why was it a test to ask Jesus a question about divorce? That seems kind of odd. The reason is there were two really big-time leading rabbis. If there were such a thing. They had probably you know, a million followers on Twitter. But two popular rabbis with differing opinions on what a verse in Deuteronomy says about the way you can put a wife away. There's a verse there that says, if you give her a writing of divorce and send her away, but it's talking about if that happens, this is the consequence. It wasn't saying it's okay to do it. So one rabbi was holding up, that is not right. Marriage is sacred before God, and you're not to walk away from that. There was another rabbi who, who do you think was more popular? He was, and he said, if she spoils your dinner, you can get rid of her. Whoa. Literally. One of the things he wrote was, if she argues too much, you can put your wife away. All you had to do was you had to put it in writing, put it in her hand, and set her out the door. Yeah, a lot of the dudes loved that because they didn't have to walk in a relationship that was about serving someone else. Can I just be honest? That's our country right now. We want something contractual. Give me something that meets my needs, that fulfills me, because I am the center of the universe. And nobody else realizes it seems to, but this revolves around me. Give me more. Help me be more about me. Marriage is the death knell to that, okay? So if you get married thinking you're coming into a contract, then you find out covenant, you're like, oh man. So this will help you if you're single, you can have the right expectations. See, I want to marry somebody that meets my needs. Man, keep praying. And stay away from my daughters. <laughs> and he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father. Jesus is quoting this. Actually, go back to verse 4. He answered, have you not read? They're testing him. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Watch verse 6, though. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore, here's the sentence, here's the clarity. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Here is the definition of the marriage covenant. When God joins two together. Okay? Listen to me. I know it's not popular. This is not hate speech, but let me just tell you this. If God is not approving and God is not joining it together, you can call it marriage till you're blue in the face, till the cows come home. It's not a marriage. It's a marriage when? When God joins it together. And I get it, man. People get married before the justice of the peace. If you did, no problem. But let me just, uh, let's just come to an understanding. Since the dawn of time, the way that God has ordered these things, listen, leave the contracts to the lawyers, but there are shepherds to handle the things of the covenant. That is, that is true. And that doesn't mean you're not married if you got married by a JP. But let me just tell you this, God has trusted the covenant with the institution of the church. And when he says, I've joined it together, that's when it's marriage. That's the definition of it. He joins the two, the two become one. That's the definition of it. That's number one. Here's the second point. Defend the covenant. Defend the covenant. Define the covenant. Defend the covenant. Now, this is one of those times, Sermon Bible, where I'm going to deliver the pizza. Okay, if you're new, you're like, I didn't know we had pizza. No, I mean... Don't kill the pizza delivery guy if you don't like the pie. I'm just going to, I want to show you something in the Word of God, okay? It's, it's, I did not write that book. 
I didn't, li- I di- I didn't write it. And I want you to like me, but you might not like me. My hope is that you'll hear this and you'll go, man, these are the ways of God. Look how clear that is. Let's do it for his glory and our good. It's so obvious. That's great. Wow. Hey, Steve, here's a nice email. Then you sign up for Marriage Mentors and you fill out your connection card and you go, yeah, I'd love to be a part of Marriage Mentors. I either want to lead a mentor group or I want to be a mentee. I want someone to mentor me. By the way, that's all you need to do. Just fill that on your connection card. Uh, June the 24th, we're going to gather together and we're going to cover that and let you learn how to do that. It's a Saturday. It's worth it. If you have any interest, just Marriage Mentors, write your name and number. We'll contact you. Uh, That's what I hope would happen. But as I say that, I'm laughing inside because there's just a lot of you that are not going to like it. And so when this got laid on my heart, I was like, well, Lord, are you sure you want me to do that? Because it's really going good. (laughs) Can I do it next year? You know, you kind of weasel a little bit, but I'm just going to say this to you, okay? We're going to defend the covenant. There's a way I got to show you to do that. And what normally comes in the mind of the culture is, oh, he's going to speak against some kind of marriage or something that he thinks is politically incorrect, or it's not that. It's just not that. That's not what defends marriage. So I'm going to put all my cards out, and then we're going to look at the text. And you know there's text, so please just wait on the text before you, before you make a judgment, okay? God, God. He instituted two things for earth, two institutions, only two. Number one, he instituted the church. Not in this order, actually. Number two, he instituted marriage. There are two institutions on earth, and each of those represents the other. Marriage is a picture of the, of the love of Jesus for the church, and the love of Jesus for the church is the example for every marriage. Okay, that's, that's very clear in Scripture. We'll look at a little of that later in the series, but for now, just I want you to understand that. And there's marriage, and there's the church. Those are the two institutions. So here's, here's my statement. Here's my unpopular statement. God help us hear it. The greatest defense in the covenant of marriage is for you to join the local church. Okay, I know, I know, I know. I know we all want, an, we want another marriage book. Well, the men don't. We want some, wait, I mean, give me 10 cute things on how to communicate better. I get it, I get it. Those are good. Talk about good sex life. You know, help us here. We need help here. Make her stop nagging. Make him show more affection. See, all of those are peripheral to the institution that accomplishes that truth. And people have a hard time hearing this. That the way to get what you're actually after is to come into the institution of it. You see, you can say you're married, but until you get married, you're not really committed to each other. Why? Because marriage is the commitment. It's when God joins you together. And you can say, well, we come to the church, we attend the church. Yeah, but that's not being a member of it. That's just attending it. And I can feel it, man. I'm pushing a nerve. You're like, you know that whole hate thing? I think he's right. I might hate you now, dude. Keep keep pushing it, buddy. I'm gonna. Coming into membership of the church allows you and affords you the very things that are there to defend the covenant that you're walking in. And I want to show that to you. I want to show it to you in Scripture. We're going to start here. We're going to start Hebrews chapter 10. This is not a lengthy ordeal. But I love you, and I want you to get it. I really do. I don't have another motive than that. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22. Let us, okay, us, what's us? It's a plural, right, because English, right? Plural, it's not let you or let me, it's let us as a group. We're going to see this thing in the context of a group. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our, there is again, plural, 
with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What's that saying? Could say in this, let's us, there's a group somewhere, let's us, whoever he's talking to, which was a church, let us gather together. Let's go to God. Hey, he made a way. He washed us with his blood. He's renewed us by the water of his word and by the spirit. Let's go. Come on, we're all going. Let's go. Let us go to God corporately together. Here we go. Next verse, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. What does that mean? Let's get together. Let's understand the gospel. Let's remember his faithfulness. Let's encourage each other. We're in this together. You see the group, right? Verse 24, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Listen to me. Show me a marriage that has those two things. I'm going to show you a good marriage. Show me a marriage that's full of love. I didn't say full of perfection because love covers a multitude of sins. That means you're going to be blowing it. I mean, there's, there's misunderstandings, miscommunications, there's fights, there's arguments. Those things are covered by love. Love and good works. And how do you get that? We consider it says, we consider how to stir up one another, how to encourage one another in loving good works. That doesn't happen as you're by yourself. And beloved, it doesn't happen because you visit the church. I know, it just doesn't. I can't count the number of couples that have come up to me through the years and said, man, we're so glad to be here. We were having problems in our marriage, problems in our family. And we just said, we looked at each other one day and we said, we need to just, we need to go, we need to get back in church. And maybe you've said that, and that's a great thing. But let me just tell you this, you're halfway there. Because church is not something you attend, it's something that you become a part of. You enter into the relationships that accomplish these things. That's what it's really about. So how do you know that? All right, well, we're not done, gonna keep going. Just gonna push on this, lean into it. I got my spam filter ready. Subject, we hate you. How dare you? I know. It's hard, man, because this is America. And not only that, it's Texas. Some of y'all, man, you got more armor in your vehicle out there right now. You got more guns than Castro did. That's cool. I got more. We're Texans, right? If you're from Oklahoma, you're not exempt. You're just as independent and staunch and, and vibrant and nobody's going to push me around. There's a part of that I love. There's a part of that God hates. Because when someone says come into the community and experience the blessings of something that you won't have all the power over, boy, that's a, that's a hard thing to understand in the cultural mindset that we live in. In verse 25, finally, it says, not neglecting to meet together. That's a group of people, guys. That's a church not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let me just tell you this. The church is the only institution anywhere that will truly encourage you in your marriage. I don't care what marriage books are out there written by some psychologist. Let me just tell you this. The one who made the institution knows how to make the institution work. He really does. And if you're looking somewhere else, I'm telling you what, guys and gentlemen, just back me up on this. Our jobs won't encourage us in our marriage, will they? And you have, oh, really? Oh. All y'all work with a bunch of angels, right? Okay. Liars. The church is an institution to breathe encouragement into the covenant of marriage because it is a great expression of the love that Jesus has for the church. Texoma needs to be able to look at us and not go, look how religious they are. Wow, they've got a great sound system. Or wow, uh, that preacher has stuff to say. He needs to be able, they need to be able to look at the marriages in our church and go, that's different. That's different. And so here's the argument that we get back. You show this to people and their first response is this. Well, poor Pastor Steve doesn't realize something, that the marriage uh, problem is the same in the church as it is in the world. Steve, did you know that <clears throat> the divorce rate 
in the church is the same as it is in the world. How many of you have heard that? Be honest. Let's do this. I never make you raise your hand. I can't make you. I'm not going to walk out, right? I'm not telekinetic. You've heard it, right? It's not true. It's not true. The divorce rate is not the same in the church as it is in the world. How do you know that? Because I'm talking about the real church, not about people playing church. Now, if you take a poll of every person who claims to be a Christian in the United States, let me just tell you what, the majority of those people are not people who would say, I have believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, I have repented of my sin, I've asked him to forgive me, and all my hope and trust is in what he has finished on the cross, that when I stand before God, my creator, my plea will be, the blood of the lamb has covered me. Now, that's what a Christian is according to Scripture. That's not who we're counting when we say the church in America. Some people would say, hey, when I was a baby, I was three months old, they poured some water over my head, done, I'm a Christian. E pluribus unum, right? My father can beat your father at dominoes. (laughs) Any ex-Catholics in here, right? That's not what it means to be a Christian. Some people in America think they're a Christian if they voted Republican. Not everybody laughed at that. (laughs) What did he say? Yeah, being a Christian means you have come into the actual body of Christ. You are born again. Listen to me. That group, the actual church, places like this that aren't, we're not playing church. Our goal is not to gather and entertain you so we can show you off, feel like we have a big institution. We exist to glorify God. That's why we're here, to make disciples of Jesus Christ through teaching, worship, community, and on being on mission. But it's about the glory of God. It's not about you liking it. It's not about you liking me. We exist for the glory of God. This is a real church run by real elders. We're not playing games. There are places playing church. I don't count them. And I'm just telling you this, in the real church, and you're in a real church, The divorce rate is not 50%. Look around. Are 50% of the people in here getting a divorce? No. Sherman Bible's been here since the early 70s. You think half the people married during that time got a divorce? No. I've been in churches, huge churches, really huge churches, for 30 years. I can guarantee you half the people that I knew who were married are not getting a divorce. Why? Because they're Christians. They're real believers. So can we do away with the whole, well, the divorce rate's the same. You know why the devil wants to do that? Because he wants us to feel like there's no place of refuge, training, security, and hope. And I'm unveiling that is a lie. When you come in to the body of Christ, the real local assembly, you come into a place that is set up to equip you and encourage you to defend the covenant with your wife and your husband. And we're going to do it. We're taking it seriously. Guys, Marriage Mentor, by the way, is not a class. It's a one-year program where you walk with another couple for a year. You say, wow, a year's a long time. Yeah, you'd rather a year of that than stay in a marriage that's, that's really suffering, wouldn't you? We see things getting healed like this. This is a God plan to pair you with people. And some of you need to be menti- mentored. Some of you need to be mentors, And as I say that, you're like, well, it can't be us because we don't have the perfect marriage. I refer you to my previous comment. All we're looking for are people who are on the journey with Jesus Christ. Listen, the mentors get just as much out of the program as the mentees do. The curriculum is set, it's structured. You'll never be at a loss at what to do. It's a beautiful thing we're offering. All you got to do is sign up for that. But the enemy tells people, no, you don't need to be in church. You don't need to join the church. So maybe you're halfway there now. You're like, okay, that says be in a church, but it doesn't say join it. So I get this question. I'm going to go ahead and answer. I'm going to say something that just might blow your hair back just a little bit. So Steve, can you show me in the New Testament where it says you should join a church? Listen to me. No. I can't. Because it doesn't say just join it. I want to show you what it does say. When we say join, man, we're making it mellow and easy. Can I show you God's prescription for your relationship to a local body? This is in your Bible. I didn't make this up. I did not write the Bible. I'm the messenger. 
Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Oh, man, you guys always keep bringing that up on me. Don't bring it up. Don't show them. They're going to... Obey. Uh-oh. Oh, heck no. Oh, no, you didn't. That's what I feel like could come off when this goes on the web. People are like, no, nope, no, no. Mm-mm. I don't obey nobody. I get it. I get it. Just, just so you know, though, your problem isn't with what I'm saying. Your problem is with the God who wrote the book. Because he says, obey your leaders. Whoa, that's heavy. Now, how can you have a leader if you haven't made a gathering that's official? How can you do that? You don't have a leader. It, when you go to the mall and there's a bunch of people gathered together, do you go, hey, who's the leader in the mall? No. You only have a leader when you've agreed that there are, in fact, people who are following. Obey your leaders Oh, it doesn't stop there, by the way. You thought joining was hard and submit to them. That's tough. And I get it, man. Thousands of people, you know, a couple thousand this weekend, the moron web, going to hear this, you're going to go, man, you don't know the wounds I have. I've been burned by church. I have too. I get it. Ladies and gentlemen, the ark that Noah was in, it stunk. It had a bunch of animals in it, but there was no other place to go. The church is the only boat afloat. If you jump out, you drown. This is the safety net. And what I can tell you about here is we're run by a group of godly men who want the will of God as disclosed in the scripture, and we want nothing more. And when it says obey, by the way, and when it says submit, it is absolute that it's in the context of diffusing and infusing and teaching the word of God. It's not about controlling you. And we need to ask somebody what car to buy. No, you don't, man. I got no time for that. That's not what it means. Oh, well, we got to show somebody our bank statement. That's demonically cultish. What we're talking about is a, a obedience of leadership and submission to them when they say, guys, here is the word of God and we must obey it. And you say, okay, that is church membership. How do we know who the sheep are if they don't come into the fold? That's why we say, if you're with us, join us. And if not, why not? Maybe you really have a reason. Maybe you go, you know what, I mean? you guys have a blind spot. Because every time I come here, this thing happens and it tells me that, man, you guys have an area of compromise or sin in your life. Do you see this? And we might go, oh my gosh, you're right. We'll repent. We'll repent. We'll repent publicly. We've got nothing on the line but the glory of God. We're, we know we're infallible. But if not, why not? Because your marriage needs to be covered somewhere. And you know what? If not here, maybe it is somewhere else, man. There are a lot of churches around here. Maybe you could visit one and you could go and you could go. Look, maybe this is the place. But if that's your place, join that place. Soak yourself into it. Yield to it. Come under those pastors. Let them teach you the word of God. Don't be rebellious when someone says, hey, we're going to confront this. We're going to ask you about this. Because, see, that's what the church can do. But I can only ask a member that. I'm not going to go to a non-member and go, hey, man, tell me about your marriage. Really? Yeah, what if I ask her? Is she okay? Because we see her, you know, she's showing up and she's bawling her eyes out. You know, I know that's extreme. But I, someone who's a guest here, why would I do that? I'm not their pastor. I'm the pastor of people that go, yeah, I'm in. I've joined. I'm coming, I'm coming in. And guys, unless you get this confused. This is not a, per, a push for membership. This is a push for strong marriages. We want to walk for a year with people. Close, weekly accountability and training and encouragement. That's an awesome thing. We don't want to just throw that out there to people to go, oh, you know, I'm not really committed to the family. But the Bible says we are to be. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Why? Why should I do that? Well, here's why. For they are keeping watch over your souls. Every member of this body is prayed for. 
pastorally cared for. When there's a need, we want to gather around. That's why we're raising certain funds that can go, look, if you're a member of our body and you hit those hard waters just like Acts, we're going to come around you. You're not going to hit the ground on our watch. You don't get that at the Moose Lodge or the YMCA, yo. That's the church's job. To watch for your soul, to care for you. How are you doing? Where have you been? Are you in a group? How's, how are you healing? How's your marriage? How are your kids? That's watching for your soul. How are you in the Lord? How can we encourage you? Not condemn you, help you. Because they watch for your souls. As those who will have to give an account. Yeah, an account to who? An account to Jesus. First Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4 says, I as an overseer, as an elder, and the other elders that are here will give an account to the chief shepherd one day. We will look at Jesus Christ. I'm 50 years old right now, so I'm pretty sure it's going to happen within the next 50. I'm going to look at him. I'm going to give an account. Did I tell you the truth? Now what you do with it, that's gonna, that affects me and that affects me now. As those that have to give an account for what they're doing and how they're shepherding. And then it says, let them do this with joy and not with groaning. Oh man, if you've been in pastoral ministry for more than 10 minutes, there are some times you just groan. Oh, won't they just let the Lord speak to them? Won't they just submit to the word? Won't they just forgive? Oh, if they would just humble themselves. Oh, there's a groaning. Then there's others just like, man, this is an awesome. I wish all the sheep acted like you. Because you joyfully come around, you joyfully give, you joyfully serve. That's most of you, by the way. I'm the most blessed pastor in America. I deeply believe that. They, they joyfully look for vision and mission to reach out to the community. They joyfully open their Bible. They joyfully attend. Holy cow. Shouldn't say that from the pulpit, probably. That's with joy. And the verse is saying, submit, obey and submit in these areas because they're watching out for your souls. They're going to give an account and let them do it with joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. See, it's bad for you when your pastor is going, oh, that's a hard thing. So let me close with this. Why do we do it? We do it for your joy. One more verse. This is first, or 2 Corinthians, rather, uh, one twenty four. This is Paul talking about his ministry, his oversight. He says, not that we lord it over your faith. Man, that is not my heart. That's not his heart. That's not our elder's heart. That is not our heart. I don't even have energy for that. I'd be a terrible cult leader. I'd be like, ah, forget them. <laughs> Who's got time for that? I got four kids. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy. It's to bless you. It's to build you. It's to encourage you. That's why I'm saying this. We're not going to spend another week on this, so i got to just get this in you. Listen, if you want to cover your marriage, join the church. And if not, why not? And for some of you, you might be sitting there just going, yeah, but I'm not sure I believe in Jesus Christ yet. Well, then right. Then you're, you're in the right place to wait because that would come out during the conversations and the trainings, that, you know, the lessons that we have. And we'd ask you, hey, where are you with Jesus? Maybe that's you. That's great. I'm cool with that. Awesome. But listen, man, help us help you. If you have questions, if you have issues, tell us what they are. You can talk to me. You can talk to Seth. Talk to any of the elders. Grab any of the pastors and just say, listen, I do. I want to cover this because I, I, I have a concern here. And if not, man, come on board. Come into the family. We want to watch over your soul. We want to put you into things like marriage mentors, into conference kind of things that can help, that can build you up in the covenant that you're in. Okay? That's my exhortation. And listen, I, I want you to like me, but if that cost me something with you, if that cost me some credit, I'm cool with that. I have to be because I know it's the truth. I know what will bless your marriage the most Come into the place where it is safest. Stand with me, and I'm going to pray a blessing over you, and, uh, and then we're going to dismiss. Seth will sing over us as we're going out. and Just as we do, let me remind you of just two things. First thing is this. 
If you want to get involved in Marriage Mentors, you want to know more information, write it on the connection card. Just write Marriage Mentors, put your name and number, and we'll contact you. We'll do the rest. The second thing is this. Altar ministry team is going to be right down here as soon as I say amen. Maybe you need prayer for your marriage today. You're in trouble. You need, you're suffering, you're hurting. Come forward. Maybe it's for something else. Let the altar ministry team meet you down here. We'd love to pray over you. Let's, let's do this. Bow your hearts right now. Father, just thank you again for your love for us. Thank you for the covenant of marriage. Thank you for the way that it demonstrates the way Jesus loves us. Lord, I pray for every single person here, married, single, divorced, going through trouble right now, no matter what, that God, we would just take your word at its face value, Lord, that you've already defined the covenant, and we're going to accept that. And Lord, you want us to defend it. I pray we would be uh, doers of the word and not hearers only, Lord. I love you. I pray your blessing over every single covenant within this house, God. Strengthen, build them, mentor them, and use us for your glory in Jesus' mighty name. God bless you guys. Love you so much. You guys are dismissed.